Yeah, hi folks. Yes, it was truly sad to see the passing of Prince Philip. He was a man who truly understood the meaning of free speech and he wasn't afraid to use it. And he had a brilliant humour as well. And contrary to what the woke folk think, people loved him for it. And so much so, they want a statue made for him. But without question, these woke fascists will try and have that cancelled. And besides being a free speaker, Prince Philip was also a climate change sceptic as well. It's official. Prince Philip, who died aged 99 on Friday, was a climate change sceptic. In a letter in 2018 from the Prince to Ian Plymer, the climate expert who was on Outsiders just last week. Yes, yeah, so let's have a look at that. Uh, Ian, you're a, a geologist. Uh, you've studied this continent. Um, the recent floods, are they uh, proof of climate change and global warming? <laughs> well, I've, I've got a toenail that dropped a rock on when I was out in the bush. That, to me, is proof of climate change because this <laughs> rock actually formed in glacial conditions. Now, you can, <laughs> you can argue that climate change is, it, it causes everything. What we don't understand and what the children are not taught is that climate always changes. Yes. And it has for 4,567 million years. And the very slight changes we are measuring today are nothing compared with those in the past. And if you look at past floods, we can see that much of the flooding is on areas called floodplains. Now, <laughs> I wonder why are these called floodplains? <laughs> Exactly. The Duke of Edinburgh not only compliments Professor Plymer on his recent book, The Climate Change Delusion, but also praises his previous book, Heaven and Earth, which similarly questioned the missing science behind the global warming scam. Furthermore, in this letter, which Ian has kindly provided to outsiders, the late Prince Philip, never one to mince his words, described the wind turbines now blotting landscapes across the globe as monstrosities. And Yes, everything the Greens do in order to try and save the planet destroys the planet. And now they're even going to start mining the ocean floors for the minerals required for electric car batteries. Now, what could go wrong with that? ...questioned whether they served any practical purpose. In fact, the Prince attempted to invite Professor Plymer to London to address the Royal Society of Artists on climate change back in 2010, but the invitation was disgracefully rescinded by the mandarins at Buckingham Palace for political reasons. And I quote the letter he received then from the palace, Dear Professor Plymer, I am writing to you with some disappointing news regarding the Prince Philip annual lecture on 5 May 2010. As you well know, the debate around climate change has recently become highly politically charged, both globally and especially in your home country. Equally, wrote the Mandarin, as I am sure you are aware, Members of the royal family need to be scrupulous in avoiding any appearance of advocating or supporting a political stance. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Prince Charles has been doing that for 40 years. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to have been invited to open this year's critical climate week. The borderless climate, biodiversity and health crises are all symptoms of a planet that has been pushed beyond its planetary boundaries. Without swift and immediate action at an unprecedented pace and scale, we will miss the window of opportunity to reset for a green-blue recovery. Yeah, so here he is pushing the global communist agenda, the UN COVID-19 Great Reset and a more sustainable and inclusive future. In other words, the global pandemic is a wake-up call we simply cannot ignore. Having been at this now for well over 40 years... Yeah, now let's contrast Prince Philip to that dangerous idiot. 
but he, you know how blunt he can be. And I just wanted to have my blunt moment with Prince Philip, just so I could tell the story as I'm about to. But I remember it was Prince Charles's 50th at Buckingham Palace, and for some bizarre reason, he invited all the editors of the papers. So I was standing with the editor of The Sun at the time, and we had these little name badges saying who we were. So Prince Philip came towards us and went, Ooh, who are you? And we shook his hand. I said, I'm afraid, sir, you're, you're surrounded by the tabloid press. And with that, he just didn't say a word. He just darted off, and he passed another editor without knowing who he was. And looked back at us and went, my God, you can't tell from the outside, can you? <laughs> <laughs> hey. In one of the villages I visited, they very kindly gave me this carved bowl. This was a studio talk he gave after a trip to New Guinea. This dance went on for about two days. Imagine they must have quite a stiff neck after that. <laughs> the huge crowd surged forward enthusiastically to see the arrival of the royal party. They were the glamorous young royal superstars of their day. Him at ease with the studio, if not with the boom microphones. But if you're having a conversation and, and somebody pokes one of these at you with a tape recorder behind or one of those long listening devices which they can overhear a conversation 20 yards away, you, you get a bit anxious. This is what you were specifically objecting Well, I don't know what, you, what this is about. Well, there was a, a quote. I, I just which object to on, them on principle. There was know. a quote, I think, which appeared on television that you uh, you suggested to a chap with one of these things how he might dispose of it. Well, in <laughs> private conversation. I, <coughs> I, I'm delighted he took it down. I hope he did it. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, I hope he shoved it up his ass. Uh, and uh, I think he just uh, became more and more popular with the public, mainly for his um, outspoken views. But those views also got him into trouble. Whole books were written about his penchant for eyebrow-raising remarks, like the time in Australia when he asked Aboriginals if they still threw spears. And he was infamously impatient with the British press. Are you well, sir? Well, do I look ill? <laughs> Brilliant answer. I've seen the world's most experienced pluck on <laughs> I mean, uh, polo is taking place at quite a high speed, and it's it's rather athletic. It comes a time in your life when you don't want to be quite so athletic anymore. Uh, yeah. I can tell you. <laughs> but, but your son, of course. Prince Charles no, he's still ball. young he and vigorous. Good? He's younger than I am. That's funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> he may not look it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he certainly doesn't. <laughs> In May, while visiting the new Welsh Assembly, he met a group from the British Deaf Association, standing by a Caribbean band. Deaf, if you're near there, no wonder you're deaf, he reportedly said. In China in the 80s, he famously described Beijing as ghastly and told British students they would all be slitty-eyed if they stayed there much longer. Yeah, it's a wonder the woke folk haven't already tried to uh, cancel him. And four years ago, he asked a Scottish driving instructor, how do you keep the natives off the booze long enough to pass the test? Yeah, now let's contrast Prince Philip to the following dangerous idiot. A less than royal narcissist. Part 37.4. The Diana Duplication. The emulation of Princess Diana by Meghan Markle continues with further examples of speaking about the similar subjects. One of which was difficult pregnancies. Diana stated that she hadn't been very well throughout her first pregnancy before William was born in June 1982 and later experienced postnatal depression after giving birth. That in itself was a bit of a difficult time, she revealed, claiming that feeling that way was very much out of character for her. You'd wake up in the morning feeling you didn't want to get out of bed, you felt misunderstood and just very, very low in yourself. For her part, Meghan pointed out that she was haunted by the memory of attending a January 2019 event at the Royal Albert Hall with Harry while she was pregnant with their son Archie. I wasn't seeing it, but it's almost worse when you feel it through the expression of my mum or my friends. 
mental health battles. In an attempt to cope with the pressures of royal life, Diana began to intentionally injure herself while dealing with bouts of depression. Maybe I was the first person, first person ever to be in this family who had ever had depression or was openly tearful, she recalled. And then... Meghan Markle revealed that she had dealt with very clear and methodical thoughts of suicide, but was apparently turned down by the royal family when she asked for help. I said that I've never felt this way before and I needed to go somewhere. I was told that I couldn't, and that it wouldn't be good for the institution. I remember this conversation like it was yesterday, because they said, my heart goes out to you because I see how bad it is, but there's nothing we can do to protect you. Both comment about being seen as a problem. Diana stated that following her separation from the Prince of Wales, that she noticed that people around the palace began to treat her differently. I was a problem. I was a liability, she told the BBC in 1995, claiming that trips abroad were being cancelled and meetings were put on hold. Meghan, for her part, sent the British press into such a frenzy whenever she went out that she was advised by the royal family to lay low. After being told that she was everywhere at one point, Meghan recalled that she had only left the house twice in four months. In an unaired clip from the interview, she remembered being told by advisers to be 50% less than her full self. Both spoke about unwanted media attention. Diana explained, I seem to be on the front of a newspaper every single day. Diana told Bashir in the 1995 interview, remembering that the media placed a lot of pressure on her marriage to Charles. It took a long time to understand why people were so interested in me, but I assumed it was because my husband had done a lot of wonderful work leading up to our marriage and our relationship. Here was a fairy tale that everyone wanted to work. After taking her relationship with Harry public in 2016, Meghan was placed under a major microscope and felt targeted by the UK tablo tabloids because of her race. While other members of the royal family were protected by the institution when faced with bad press, Meghan didn't have that same privilege. And if a member of this family will comfortably say, we've all had to deal with things that are rude, rude and racist are not the same, she said. And equally, you've also had a press team that goes on the record to defend you, especially when they know some things are not true. And that didn't happen for us. Furthermore, about making a difference, Diana stated, I'd like to be an ambassador for this country, Diana said when asked about her future following her split from Charles. I've been in a privileged position for 15 years. I've got tremendous knowledge about people and how to communicate. I've learned that. I've got it. And I want to use it. Looking forward to life after her royal tenure, Meghan said that she hopes she and Harry can continue to be pillars of positive change through their Archwell Foundation and other initiatives. This is what we're doing, right? We're still doing it. We're still going to always do the work. Yeah, now I'll just fast forward a bit. As also mannerisms. It's been noted that Meghan has adopted copying Diana's mannerisms, particular head tilts, body language. And where you look at photographs, you can see that she adopts those similar mannerisms and body language to that of which Princess Diana has utilised. It's evident that there is an unconscious commandeering of various character traits of personality, style, clothing, views, wording, and other trappings that were associated with Princess Diana, that Meghan Markle's narcissism as part of character trait acquisition has acquired and is utilising to bolster her facade which in turn allows her to assert control over people, and also for the purposes of directly controlling Prince Harry by providing him with repeated unconscious reminders of his mother. Wow, a dangerous woman, and Harry has fallen for it. Now folks, I've posted a, posted a link to that below. Yeah, so where to from here? I can't see the Queen standing down. I think she knows that Charles can't do it, and the longer she holds on, the better. She's not stupid. She knows you can't have a king going around pushing UN-driven climate change propaganda. And I'm afraid William is not much better. <laughs>